Good evening and thank you for joining us. My name is Corey Nettles. I have the great honor of being the chair of the Board of Trustees for the Medical College of Wisconsin. So this is another one of our series of Monday evening town halls where we bring to you some of the most respected leaders in our community and their particular disciplines to talk to us about COVID-19. It is our goal through these town halls to be a trusted source of truth and to bring you accurate information that you and your families can rely on as you figure out how best to navigate uh, COVID-19 and how to stay safe. We hope that you will share the information that you get here uh, with others in our community, whether it's the slides or this presentation or other information that's available to you on our website. So tonight we have another great group of panelists, some of whom are returning, others it will be their first time with us. First is Dr. Joyce Sanchez. She is an assistant professor of medicine, infectious diseases at uh, MCW. Then we have Dr. Leonard Aghetti. He's a professor of medicine and eminent scholar, chief division of general internal medicine and director, the Center for Advancing uh, Population Science. We also have with us tonight, Dr. Heather Paradis. She's deputy commissioner of, the medical, of medical services, chief medical officer, the city of Milwaukee health department. And finally, we have Nathan Lamberton. He's primary care clinical pharmacist, with Ascension Health, and he's an assistant professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin Pharmacy School. Thank you to all of our panelists for being here. We encourage you to submit your questions uh, online throughout, and we'll be sure to get to those. And without further ado, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you, Corey. So I'm going to take you through the this first slide that describes the daily incidence, and that is the number of new cases per day that we're seeing in the state of Wisconsin. And that has continued to increase, as you can see. However, the past few days has shown that the increases have gotten smaller. Next slide, please. This slide describes some of the trends that we're seeing. Uh, the first point that we'll make is that the doubling times continue to increase, which is a good thing. Secondly, that our daily growth rates and percent of positive tests of all tests that are sent per day has decreased in both the state of Wisconsin as well as in Milwaukee. We also see that the number of positive tests uh, today in Wisconsin has about 272 and Milwaukee specifically is at 52. Now, our testing capacity has actually been quite stable now. We're at about 11,000 tests per day, which is great. Um, and we're keeping an eye on both our ICU and personal protective equipment or PPE availability. At this point, it's stable and sufficient, but both of these areas are being monitored, especially because PPE has seen major supply chain disruptions over the past several weeks. Next slide, please. This slide walks you through testing capacity statewide as it's grown over time. And as you can see here, um, the testing capacity has been increased significantly and it will continue to increase. Um, so I'm told by our local laboratories, the majority of the testing has been direct viral testing and our capacity to give follow-up care has increased along with the testing. So at this point, anyone with symptoms in the state of Wisconsin should now be able to get tested. Next slide, please. So I'll review a little bit the two kinds of tests that are available. The first is a direct viral test, and that checks for samples from your respiratory system. And it tells you if you're currently infected with the virus. And because this testing is more widely available, if you have any symptoms, please call your doctor to request a test. And if you don't have a doctor, you can call 211. The second type of test called an antibody test can only tell you if you've had COVID-19, but it's not yet known if having a positive test or antibodies to COVID-19 virus can protect you from getting infected with COVID-19 again. This test is also not widely available for the public yet in Wisconsin. Please note that some viral tests, you can get some turnaround time quickly. Our point of care tests for the direct testing, the diagnostic tests can be available within an hour. And other direct diagnostic tests take between one and three days after they're received by the lab. So the turnaround time will really be dependent on whether it's a point of care test or a send out test. Next slide, please. 
Please know if you have symptoms of COVID-19 that because we have the testing capacity to do so, call your healthcare provider about discussing testing. These are the list of symptoms that are described by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention that were expanded a couple of weeks ago. And symptoms that would qualify you for testing include cough and shortness of breath, or two of the following that include fevers, chills, uh, repeated uh, chills with um, shaking, muscle pain, headaches, or throat, or new loss of taste and smell. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Agetti. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, prevent, preventing the spread of COVID-19 in elderly African-Americans in Milwaukee. And I think, uh, so every uh, day I look at the, uh, the information from Milwaukee County like twice a day when the results are reported. And the, uh, I'm still waiting for the day when I get to a point where the results are flat and there are no changes, but we're not there yet. And what we know right now is that African-Americans who live in senior uh, housing, assisted living, nursing homes, or homeless shelter as, uh, at especially high risk for COVID, just in addition to just having the risk, but also being a risk group. And the, and the current data for Milwaukee shows that 41% of confirmed cases are in African-Americans, 51% are individuals age 50 and older, and 50% of, of deaths are among African-Americans, and 95% of the deaths are among those age 50 and older. So this uh, suggests that if you're African-American and you are older than 50 and also live in some of these locations we described, your risk is probably significantly higher than the average individual. Next slide, please. So one of the things we're trying to do from the Medical College of Wisconsin is to uh, try to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the elderly African-American population in Milwaukee. And this is a, uh, a, a grant we received from the Advancing Healthcare Wisconsin Endowment with the goal of identifying uh, uh, and uh, very early and preventing the spread of COVID-19. And uh, what we're trying to do is to identify individuals who are going to be at high risk and then I, uh, screening them very early on. So we're testing them, those who live in senior housing, assisted living, nursing homes, or homeless shelters who are located in the Milwaukee North Side with the goal of mo moving into the uh, other areas once we kind of get those areas covered. And uh, there's a, a flyer that's available for people to, uh, to download, but also to, you can request a flyer. There's a number to call, and that number is 414-955-7390. 414-955-7390. Seven three nine zero, and this is a number to call if you are eligible and you think you are you qualify. Also, for individuals who are uh, um, who are run or who are part of staff of some of these areas who need us to come out and test, we go to them and we're actually willing to go out there and do the testing. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, who's eligible for this uh, program? Uh, African-Americans age 50 and older who live in senior housing, nursing homes, assisted living or homeless shelters uh, are, uh, may be eligible. And uh, the goal is not just to screen, uh, we're actually screening and providing education. And uh, we are trying to do the, uh, just based on what we know about the community and some of the, of the feedback we've received from community members, We've developed the educational program to really focus on some of the key questions people have. And we're using multiple screening sessions. We're also paying attention to the fact that if you're elderly, uh, in one session uh, education may not be sufficient. So we're trying to do a series of educational sessions that really provide information. Other thing we're also doing now is that there's a lot of misinformation about what the test actually covers and what kind of results you get. So we're having people asking questions about, you know, what if the test is negative? What if the test is positive? What does that really mean? So we're actually providing that level of education at the level of a probably fifth to sixth grade reading level. So that individuals who are who we actually call and we can provide that information, it helps them understand uh, what is going on. We're also making sure that people understand what to expect on the day of the test. So when they actually come in, they actually have a clear sense of what to expect and how to maintain social distancing while the testing is being done. And then uh, the educational sessions are delivered by telephone. So the goal is to really make sure that people, we can get them when it's convenient for them, wherever they are, we actually provide information. And we are also able to go out to whatever location people are to get the test done. The team that goes out is fully uh, protected, wearing uh, full PPE uh, for protection, both for our staff 
but also for the uh, for the uh, participants who actually participate. Uh, the only requirement we have is that individuals, because this is, uh, um, um, you know, we're using uh, we're using research protocol. Individuals actually have to call ahead of schedule, get uh, 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 um, enrolled before they can actually uh, get screened. So this is not just uh, walk-in screening. We actually want to make sure that people are actually well uh, educated before they come in and they actually get screened. The other thing I would like to mention is that we also have we are also collecting blood to do antibody testing, and that antibody testing the focus is to use more of the IgM, which is a more reliable approach, and that allows us to identify individuals who are not just who have been who screen positive, but those who actually have antibodies already who can potentially be uh, individuals we identify for uh, who are likely to be, be previous exposure, but also may have antibodies to the virus. And now I'm going to turn over my the presentation to Dr. Perry. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here tonight on behalf of a collective initiative aimed at increasing community testing across Milwaukee. Next slide. So to date, as Dr. Sanchez mentioned, there have been shortages of PPE, of lab and testing resources. And initially in the COVID outbreak, some narrow testing guidelines of which specimens could be sent to our public health laboratories. And that has all resulted in our current testing rate uh, averaging about 300 to 500 tests a day across our community. Next slide. We recognize that increasing testing is essential for preventing the spread of COVID-19, for early identification of people who are in need of medical support and social care. And it's part of the Badger Bounce Back Plan that we need to increase testing to a certain level to be able to safely reopen our society. The testing guidelines have also been expanded, as was noted earlier, to include all symptomatic individuals should seek a testing at this point in time. And our supply chain issues, uh, although they do continue to some degree, um, many have been resolved. Next slide. So the goal of this work group is to assure that every Milwaukee County resident who is displaying symptoms consistent with COVID-19 has access to testing. Our initial measure is to get to 2,000 tests a day, hopefully over the next couple of weeks, while considering some secondary measures that we will be tracking. We also want to provide equitable access to testing, so really examining those sites across our community and ensuring that all individuals have proper access. We want to be able to connect individuals because these are individuals who are displaying symptoms, want to try and uh, connect them to follow up care. And we want to ensure timely collection of some of the demographic information. Wisconsin was one of the first states that was able to demonstrate through the collection of demographics some of the disparities that exist in COVID-19 infection rates and outcomes among individuals. And we want to continue that same high level of collection, data collection. And we wanna provide a public facing dashboard to let you all know how we are doing with our testing initiative. Next slide, please. So this is the community initiative, testing initiative work group. It is being convened through the Milwaukee Healthcare Partnership, has leadership and representation from our state emergency operations, our county emergency operations, and our local health departments. In addition to representation across our community health center, federally qualified health center sites, and the private health sector. Next slide, please. So the strategies of this work group. One, we are understanding how to better secure and deploy National Guard testing teams that are available through the state to support provider testing sites, to support uh, hot spotting or testing at certain facilities, shelters, long-term care, skilled nursing facilities. And then in the next phase, how can we use them to support testing for our essential workers and those who are uh, either remaining or returning to the workplace? 
Secondly, it's to expand healthcare provider-based testing. As I said, our uh, federally qualified health center group has been out a little bit ahead and had just la as of last week has expanded testing to include patients outside of their typical. I apologize that my work lights like to shut off. Um, we are also seeing um, several health systems beginning to uh, publicize the opening of new ambulatory centers and clinics that will also be receiving members from the community uh, for testing. And then some other sites that uh, I believe will be mentioned a little bit later by their next presenter. Next. We also have a community outreach and education group. We are using 211 as a call center to help triage individuals to a testing site that is convenient in hour and location to them. We are also developing a website and an interactive map where individuals can go to find a testing site near them. There will be marketing materials and a campaign. And then finally, as I mentioned, measurement and reporting that includes a public facing dashboard of how many tests are being performed across our community each day, the positivity rate, and demographics. Next. So our next steps, our group is well underway and several weeks uh, into our initiative. We have already implemented testing throughout the FQHC network, and as I said, several health systems have also started to stand up uh, independent testing sites. We are in process with our outreach and education, and we really want to ensure from a public health standpoint, too, that we have a robust and effective uh, contact tracing group to perform the necessary public health follow-up to uh, prevent the spread. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Parity. So uh, with the conclusion of our uh, presentation portion of this town hall, I just wanna help us explore a little bit more of what the professional pharmacy is doing to also uh, impact the increasing need for COVID-19 testing. So it's always nice to start off by recognizing that almost 90% of Americans live within five miles of a pharmacy. So we know that pharmacists remain one of the most accessible healthcare professionals to our communities. And when we think about solutions to increasing testing, we really wanna think of the ease of access for our patients and allowing them to get to places that they normally frequent to get these tests. Uh, we'd also like to point out that pharmacies will remain essential services. So we know patients with chronic and also uh, some more acute illness will need medications and will need that access. So pharmacies will remain open and are not restricted by uh, the, the rule of only 10 people per gathering. So we'd like to make sure that everyone's aware as you enter a pharmacy, it's still uh, in line with the CDC recommendations that you do wear a face mask, especially in those environments when you're interacting with other patients or other healthcare professionals that are interacting with patients quite frequently as well. One of the things that pharmacies continue to face challenges with, especially in recent weeks as we start ramping up the uh, amount of different tests, is that companies are promoting potentially fraudulent COVID-19 testing supplies. So we know many community pharmacies provide point of care tests for our patients, and now these companies are relying on that service when they try to sell these products to pharmacies, which ultimately might get into the hands uh, of patients. And we really want to make sure from a pharmacy perspective that we're only investing in products that we know will actually be accurate for our patients. Next slide. So with the increasing need for COVID testing, it's worthwhile to point out that back in March, uh, the Health and Human Services actually dictated that licensed pharmacists are now authorized to order and to also administer COVID-19 tests to their patients. So we'd like to think this is really hinged upon the accessibility and the, the widespread distribution of both retail and independent community-based pharmacies and how that pharmacist is usually one of the first points of contact to a healthcare professional that many Americans have. So we know in pharmacy settings now, there are currently three self-swab tests that are approved uh, for use by pharmacies. And where that's really unique is it's starting to get
Uh, Dr. Lambertson, you went mute about 20 seconds ago. Apologies, sir. Uh, not sure if you heard that. Dr. Lambertson, you're muted. Uh, and don't require this uh, really in-depth nasopharyngeal uh, sample as well. So we know this to be uh, the case because there was actually a study of about 500 patients out in Washington that compared uh, the accuracy of a healthcare provider test where they used the nasopharyngeal swab where they actually went to the back of the nasal cavity and compared that to patients who do the self swab under the direction of a healthcare provider. And they actually found no meaningful difference in the rate of actually detecting COVID-19. So that's how we know that's something we can do in the pharmacy setting. Next slide, please. All right, and then lastly, thinking about here in the Milwaukee area, uh, to point out a few different pharmacies, again, as a primary care pharmacist, I don't actually spend time in these pharmacies, so I have no affiliations. I'm just really trying to get you the objective facts of what we know at this point. Uh, so we know that Walgreens in the Milwaukee community is actually testing uh, by appointment. So you're able to go online and actually fill out a quick health assessment and uh, develop an appointment date and time where you would then present to a Walgreens. Uh, these pharmacies are now starting to set up these uh, makeshift drive uh, drive throughs which are not their typical drive-through where many patients would pick up prescriptions, but a separate drive-through uh, where they can go and essentially a healthcare professional will come out, provide them with the kit, direct them through the test. The patient remains in their car. They don't have to come into direct contact with any healthcare professionals and they complete the self swab in their car and then turn it back over to the pharmacist who will then process the results and generally patients will be notified within 24 hours. CVS Health, although not currently testing here in the Milwaukee area, uh, is targeting about mid-May to really unravel their national plan for uh, in improving tests. Uh, they will also require an appointment and healthcare questionnaire. They will add what's unique uh, as a, a curbside service. So you'll be able to stay in your car, not necessarily in this drive through but at the curb outside the pharmacy. Um, and what we know is that they're really going to start prioritizing the Minute Clinic locations. So those CVS pharmacies that have the Minute Clinic uh, as their first locations where they're trying to roll this out. To name a few others like Walmart, uh, our pick and save and metro market pharmacies uh, currently are not testing the Wisconsin community. Uh, really where you'll see those more often is in the Illinois community. So um, as more options become available, we'll make sure to keep you up to date on where patients can go uh, to get these tests that uh, is really meant at increasing access to the community at large uh, to places where otherwise, uh, you know, patients wouldn't necessarily have access. And on the right side of this slide here, we just have a quick depiction of what this new swab looks like, the nasal swab. Uh, and you'll notice it only goes about a centimeter up into the, the nasal cavity. So uh, it's a lot less um, invasive and it's, it's less unpleasant than the traditional test and really just requires the patient to uh, swab the inside of their nostril four times around. Usually takes about 10 to 15 seconds and then we'll switch to the other nostril and they'll do that as well. They place it in the tube, they break off the end and then hand it back to the pharmacist and that's just the test right there. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Corey Nettles and we'll get into the, the next part of our town hall meeting. Great. Well, maybe I'll kick off the first question, Amber, starting with you. How much do these tests cost and are they covered by insurance? Great question. Uh, and I know that's going to be a concern for a lot of patients. As of right now, uh, from what I can tell from CVS and Walgreens websites, that these tests will be free of charge. Um, so I think that's a really interesting aspect that we need to consider. Um, but uh, unfortunately, insurances have not caught up with the, the pharmacist's role in testing these things. So we don't know from an insurance reimbursement standpoint what that looks like long term. Great, thank you. Well, Eric, have we received other questions from our town hall audience? And we encourage the town hall audience to keep submitting those questions. We'll get to as many of them as we can. Yes, we have been receiving questions. So as Mr. Nettle said, please do keep sending them in and we'll get to what we can. Our first questions are gonna be about testing. Uh, and first up is when will direct viral testing become available for individuals without apparent symptoms? I can start uh, with that, at least with the experience at Friedrich and the Medical College of Wisconsin. We're on a daily basis evaluating what the capacity is. And now that we have the capacity to test everybody who has symptoms, we've also started rolling out testing those who are not symptomatic. And those are individuals who are being hospitalized to some of our higher risk units like hematology, oncology, or those undergoing some high risk procedures or uh, like a bronchoscopy where you get direct samples of fluid down into the lower respiratory tract or high risk surgeries. 
And then uh, to follow up uh, for, for the study I described, all of those uh, tests, you do not have to have symptoms to get tested. Uh, you just have to be in the age range and live uh, and be in one of those uh, high risk groups we described. And I would say that from a public health perspective, we are already testing uh, groups of asymptomatic individuals, in particular where we are seeing outbreaks and needing to perform investigations of certain facilities or groups of people that either work and or live together. So we will oftentimes uh, enter into those agreements uh, intending to test everyone, those with and without symptoms. And from the pharmacy setting, uh, to echo what's already been said, very similar um, concepts where uh, the pharmacies are tending to target those patients who have symptoms and, and need that test now. Um, but as we start to realize um, the high-risk patients who don't have symptoms, but we want to make sure we're catching it early, uh, might be a potential option to reach out and uh, potentially test those patients as well. Okay, next question. Uh, when a patient tests positive for COVID-19 and whether or not the patient is hospitalized, what's the process of sharing symptoms and the timeline the patient had with other medical professionals? And is every patient shared so more knowledge can be gained? So I, 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 can, I can pick it, I can start from a, um, from a primary uh, perspective. So, um, most patients who present, uh, uh, who are being tested, usually uh, will start off as being a person under investigation. What that means is that you actually have some symptoms that prompted the testing. And so those symptoms are usually what is tracked initially. And then in a, uh, in, as part of your history, additional information will be gathered from, from you. And that information then is used to inform uh, how we make decisions about testing. So for those who are, uh, who've been tracking this, we have relaxed our uh, symptom uh, requirements over time based on the feedback we have from patients and based on, on results. So when this all started, it used to be that you had to have fever and then cough and, sh and shortness of breath. And now we've actually removed fever as a, as a primary requirement. And we're actually broadening the scope of, of, of symptoms we allow to uh, test you. So I think we're using all, that, all of that information as part of our process for decision making. And what happens uh, once a specimen is collected is it's processed in a laboratory and then the results of that test, both positive and negative, are entered into a state electronic database. And that facilitates the exchange of information from the laboratory setting over to public health. And public health follows up with every individual who has a positive test for COVID. And we engage in an in-depth interview with those individuals. And the things we ask about are not only demographic information about age and race, and we ask about information about their place of employment, about travel that they may have had, uh, about other aspects of their life, as well as their symptomatology. So really, when did symptoms present? What symptoms did you have? And this is an ever evolving and um, changing situation, which is why we have seen uh, practice guidelines and symptomatology updated several times over the past eight weeks that we've been engaged with this process. And we're continuing to learn more. And as the state uh, too is understanding more, they are adding additional questions um, to try and understand this disease and how it might present in certain populations. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question to walk through the testing numbers again um, between the, the MCW numbers and then the numbers um, from the city of Milwaukee. Um, the questioner was wondering about the, an apparent discrepancy between those numbers and if those could be reviewed. Okay, um, if you could go to my, for my uh, portion, if you go to slide, I think it's slide number eight or slide number nine. Okay, so yes, no slide number eight. So that's that's the number that we have for the uh, for the MCW study I described is four one four 
955-7390. And that's the number you can call uh, if, you are, if you're eligible or you want to uh, find out if you're eligible. Uh, and then from there, uh, the team will, take, uh, will, will, uh, will work it out and get you scheduled. In, in general, for Freighter than the Medical College of Wisconsin, their general public hotline for COVID-19 is 414-805-2000. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was actually a question for that for that exact thing too, so I'm glad we got that. Um, the the other question that I mentioned earlier was actually in regards to the number of of people being tested, uh, the actual physical daily numbers, um, if those could be reviewed. So I I think that uh, my rates were from a couple of weeks ago when the testing initiative group began, and so based on today's testing, uh, are somewhat low estimates of the testing that is occurring across our community. I believe Dr. Sanchez said that it is close to about a thousand tests a day that we are currently achieving. Yeah, so if you if you go to the testing capacity, we have 11,000 that we can possibly test um, in the state. Um, of course, Milwaukee is going to be less than that, and Wisconsin Diagnostic labs which is the lab affiliated with freighter and the medical college of wisconsin is just another snippet of that i don't think i have the total numbers on the slide before that do i i don't think i do i'd have to check back and and get back to the person asking the question about what the current numbers look like today okay great thank you um okay can asim asymptomatic individuals be that way for the 14-day quarantine period and then develop symptoms that would require additional quarantine? I can take a stab there. I've not seen it reported um, where someone is exposed and then outside of that 14-day period, at least not in a meaningful way. I suppose anything is possible, and we're no longer as early in the pandemic as we used to be, but um, as far as what we've been seeing there, we haven't seen that as being any primary or even secondary driver of this pandemic. Okay, thank you. Our next question, uh, how long can the virus live on steel? Uh, there are many different opinions out there, and it would be nice to know the real answer. I mean, I can take a crack at that. I, I, I think the data that we have right now is based on some simulation that was done. Uh, we don't know for a fact how long the virus lives on all the different surfaces that are out there. Uh, we do know that uh, certain surfaces are, they, they are, so they live longer on steel than they do on other uh, surfaces. And uh, so I, I think the, the um, the, the most reliable response right now is that we are not sure exactly how long it stays. Because I, I don't want to tell someone, oh, it's 72 hours, and then you get infected uh, after 72 hours, and then that would be what is uh, uh, reported. So I think we just need to be aware that the duration is longer, and it actually stays as long as 72 hours on steel compared to other surfaces. Thank you. Uh, these next two questions uh, deal with contact tracing. Uh, when we contact trace in the workplace, when, some, when someone first shows symptoms, how far back should we ask them about close contact? So when we are asking, interviewing individuals about symptoms, we ask them to recall their steps two to three days prior to symptom onset. Okay, thank you. And then the next question is um, similar: um, is does this contact tracing go? Is this being done citywide? So yes, all jurisdictions uh, of public health, and for Milwaukee County, that is eleven different jurisdictions. Uh, 
employ their own uh, contact tracing efforts. And then the state has also uh, developed a robust workforce to assist with overflow cases. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Um, can the panel discuss more about what to expect in our quote unquote new normal um, as many will soon be returning to work with the softening of the safer at home um, restrictions? I can start um, and I'm sure that the rest of the panelists can chime in too. Um, this is not something that we've really had any experience with in this generation. So a lot of it is gonna be um, an experiment, right? So we're gonna start lightening up on some of these measures and then collect data as uh, things come along, um, how many new cases are reported per day, um, how many deaths there are, how many ICU beds do we have, how many ventilators, what is the status of our PPE, and then reevaluating. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will be wise as we go ahead with these um, opening up measures, um, but this is admittedly something that's new to everybody. And I think if we all could um, predict, uh, we would probably be fools to, to give accurate predictions and assessments. Um, so. Yeah, and I, I think um, just from all predictions, uh, uh, COVID is gonna be with us for at least 18 to 24 months. And so I think people need to start thinking about this as a long-term process. And everything we're doing right now is really to slow the surge as opposed to trying to, uh, we, until we get a vaccine and we can test everyone, we really are not going to be able to determine uh, uh, to establish control over the virus. So where we are right now is trying to minimize the number of people who present to the healthcare facility with symptoms. But eventually the goal would then be to be able to do testing, uh, widespread testing, antibody testing, and then uh, once you have a vaccine, once we have these three things in place, then we actually have good control of the virus, and then we can actually get to the point where we can say we've actually uh, achieved uh, uh, the, uh, the the ideal situation. Until then, it's going to be still uh, what Dr. Sanchez described, where we're working as best as we can, recognizing that we may end up having uh, uh, spikes again, and just paying attention to all the social distancing strategies that are in place right now. So I would say that masks have become our new norm. We've got mine right here in the workplace, um, as well as social distancing and physical barriers. I think we're going to, we've already seen um, proliferation of sanitation products um, being used much more visibly and frequently in our environments. And I think that we can expect to continue to see that. Uh, we are beginning to advise uh, across the city with some of our uh, partner agencies who are planning to bring back individuals, essential workers, to the workplace uh, and advising on some of those similar measures. And I, I wanted to go back to the question that was asked previously because I, I did uh, go back to look up information about how long the COVID virus stays on surfaces. And there are two studies that have been published. And the summary of those two studies, uh, uh, one was in the New England Journal of Medicine, and what they concluded from the uh, simulation studies they did was that on plastic, it lasts, it can stay up to three to seven days. On stainless steel, about three to seven days. On copper, only about four hours. Uh, paper, up to four days. And then on glass, up to four days. And cardboard boxes, about 24 hours. And wood, up to two days. So uh, what that tells us is that uh, there's the variability in, uh, in uh, how long the virus stays on different surfaces. Obviously, copper appears to be the, uh, uh, to be the best in terms of the duration. But beyond that, I think regardless of the surface you're dealing with, wiping down regularly uh, uh, is probably going to be the best strategy in terms of trying to uh, prevent uh, the spread of the virus. And I would just second a lot of what the other panelists have said. I don't have a whole lot to add, but I'd also like to think of it in terms of just healthcare in general and how that might change over a long period of time based on what we're seeing from the effectiveness of some of these virtual telehealth visits, as some of you may have already experienced, where you chat with a healthcare provider through a video chat or through a phone, uh, phone call and manage chronic disease over the phone that way. 
And from a clinical pharmacist perspective, you know, a lot of what we do is to help manage chronic disease over the phone. So I think you might see the ability to manage some of these uh, issues that don't necessarily require an in-office face-to-face visit becoming some of the new normal, as a lot of other virtual distance technology is proving to at least be beneficial to get us through the time as we have it right now, and what that looks like even after this um, gets back to the new normal, we'll call it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, what are the plans to get patients back into freighter to, to see their MCW physicians and continue with needed follow-up care? So uh, I think uh, from, uh, this is really, there's a whole team right now working on this and trying to uh, uh, establish uh, safe practices to ensure that we can actually bring patients back in and bring them back in quickly. Uh, you know, on the primary care stage, we're using a lot of telemedicine, but the goal is uh, is to really begin to bring open up our uh, operating rooms as soon as possible, so people can get elective surgeries. Beginning to have strategies for identifying patients who need to be seen face to face, and how do we see them as quickly as possible? And then for those uh, who uh, uh, who it may not be appropriate for us to see them face to face, having a telemedicine platform very active and very robust to manage that. And I think we are uh, right. Now we're achieving most of those goals, and the, the trajectory uh, is uh, is uh, in the right direction. Uh, we, are the, like I said, there's a team that's looking into this, and the goal is really to reopen uh, Freedet and MCW to the to the point where we were pre-COVID, and we're doing that as soon as possible. Yeah, and I think every different sector across the freighter enterprise is going to be opening up in a stepwise fashion and very thoughtful. Fully, um, and collecting data as they go along this process. So each each different division, each department, each clinic is is rolling out their their asks, so to speak, um, their their expectations, what what they they hope to be doing. And then as those get reviewed by a higher board as to um, what's going to be allotted, a lot of it will be um, dependent on the bottleneck of PPE because we want to make sure that we protect our healthcare staff as well as the patients. Those, those come first. Obviously, there are circumstances where an in-person visit is going to be necessary and the rollout is not going to be affecting those people, uh, those patients' ability to come in. Is there a central plan in place for how to safely open retail storefronts? Not that I know of. <laughs> when do you expect large group events to be open again? Sporting events, concerts, mm -hmm. these sorts of large gatherings? So I would say that this is uh, going to be a decision that will be made uh, at, at multiple levels. I think uh, obviously the CDC is going to be taking a lead on this in terms of providing evidence for us and, uh, and guidance in terms of when to do that. And then uh, uh, obviously the governor is going to have to make a decision based on, on good evidence on when is the right time to do this. So I think these are questions that are going to be uh, over the next uh, several weeks are going to be things that people are thinking about and the, uh, the individuals who are in the position to analyze the evidence but also who are, who are going to be able to evaluate what is safe for the state are going to make those decisions going forward. Certainly we're already starting to see some large events uh, being canceled for the summertime. So the fireworks along the lake, we early on uh, Summerfest and other gather, large gatherings were canceled or delayed. Uh, we are continuing to keep our eye on the DNC, which uh, has not yet decided to go virtual, though um, I, I would be surprised if we are allowing gatherings of multiple thousands of individuals by the summertime. When do you anticipate Freighter and other hospitals in the Milwaukee area allowing family members into the hospital when a patient is undergoing a major surgical procedure requiring an inpatient stay post-op?
Uh, I would I'll take a crack at that. I think this is uh, part of the uh, the process has been implemented right now, evaluating safety, evaluating our capacity to manage uh, uh, you know uh, infection uh, control, but also uh, looking at the volumes as things uh, continue to improve. And uh, there's a, uh, like I said, there's a team that's evaluating all of these aspects of, of reopening, and uh, definitely there'll be there'll be guidelines that'll be, that'll be out uh, very soon uh, once that team is done with their evaluation and determining when it is safe to actually allow people to come back into the hospital. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question: Can pets be infected and transferred? to humans? So we sure. know um, the... Uh... Go ahead, Dr. Dr. Parody. Okay, I was gonna say we, we know from uh, some investigations that were actually done here in Milwaukee by a CDC uh, team studying household transmissions that they recognized that uh, the majority of the families that they were engaged with did have pets and so they're actually planning to do some further study uh, at a later date specifically looking at the possibility of pet transmission and how that transmission occurs whether it is human to animal and whether animal to human um, has the potential to spread i'll let dr sanchez add anything else about that I love that Milwaukee was involved in some of that work. That's that's outstanding. We um, we know from early in this pandemic about uh, felines, you know, domestic cats and and tigers, um, where there's transmission from human to the feline and then from uh, animal to animal. Um, I think just this past couple of weeks, there was a report of dogs being infected, and for a while we thought dogs were actually quite safe. Um, we know that ferrets can acquire um, infection too. What I don't think we really understand is whether or not that is a big vehicle to for pets to transmit to other humans back. Um, that's of course going to be of great concern. Um, so as we kind of ride through this, we'll we'll get to understand more, and every day we're learning more. As of now, I would treat any pets um, just like a family member as most pet owners do. And uh, so if you're sick uh, with symptoms, if you're tested for COVID-19 and you're positive, in addition to isolating from yourself from other family members, I would do the same with your pet. Well, I, I, would, I would add that right now, there is no uh, evidence that uh, uh, there's transmission of COVID from pets to humans. That's still, um, the, the evidence is not there. So I think, uh, while we are uh, very cautious about this, we need to be very clear that the data right now does not suggest that pets are transmitting COVID to, their, uh, to, to humans. Uh, it was mentioned that masks being would be the new normal. How often should we be washing them? How many should each person have? Those are great questions, and usually it, a lot depends on how many hours a day you're needing to wear a mask. Typically, we recommend uh, for disposable masks, uh, changing them when they become wet or soiled, and I would suggest the same criteria for a soft cloth or fabric mask, that once you're wearing it enough uh, and speaking through it so that it's become moist, that's a good time to put it through the wash. So how many do you need? A lot too depends on how much time you need to spend out of your own home um, and being within six feet of others. They may be the next fashion statement. I'd say they already have become that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Next question, what is the status of antibody testing? I heard in the news uh, that there is not a test that is up to 99% accurate. Uh, can you tell us more about what specifically antibody testing tells us?
Well, I can start. Uh, anybody testing will uh, be able to tell you if you've been exposed uh, to COVID-19. And a lot of people, particularly um, children we know could, can carry the virus and never exhibit symptoms, whereas adults tend to develop m mild to moderate to severe symptoms. Um, what There are two tests that at least uh, Freighter and the Medical College of Wisconsin um, are going to be rolling out for seroprevalence studies uh, for those purposes, not for diagnostic purposes. One is the Roche test and one is the Abbott test. And those can uh, have very, very good sensitivity, um, higher than 99%, and in the general population have a performance uh, greater than 99% specificity, which is excellent. Um, there are some limitations, however, for example, in a subset of people who have had another human coronavirus, um, that specificity, meaning the ability to distinguish a false positive from a true positive, goes down to 95%. And that still sounds pretty high, but when we're talking about thousands of people who we may be using this for seroprevalence um, investigations, that can be a substantial number. Um, so we do not use it for diagnostic purposes, but we can use it for determining what the prevalence of uh, COVID-19 has been in a given population. We'll be seeing a lot more data come in over the coming weeks regarding some of these studies. And, and, and just to put that in perspective, uh, I think uh, people need to be aware that coronaviruses other than COVID-19 actually cause a common cold. And so if you've been exposed uh, to uh, uh, the regular coronavirus that causes the common cold, there's possible cross-reactivity with, the, uh, with this particular uh, uh, process. And that's why uh, there might be a slight drop in sensitivity. But even at that, at 95%, that's still really high and really useful in terms of identifying people who have, have had previous exposure. And I, th I think it's really important to point out too, that I think at last check, there were over 150 different antibody tests that are commercially available. And only about 10 to 12 of those have actually received authorization from the FDA to actually be used. Um, so I think as consumers and as healthcare professionals, we need to make sure that we're up to date on which tests actually have that ability to detect antibodies in people who truly have them and also rule out people who don't actually have antibodies. So that way we're not falsely sending patients back out into the community who think they're protected, but otherwise are not. So I think it's, it's just really nice to highlight the fact that as a consumer, as a healthcare professional, there are so many options and there's gonna be advertisements. There's gonna be a lot of things that, that circulate and the FDA has resources available to see which ones have actually passed their validity standards as well. So I think it's really worthwhile to point out that we recognize there are a ton of different options and it's really just going to rely on the evidence to dictate which ones we know are reliable. What do we know about the rehab needs for COVID patients? So that, that is an unknown right now uh, because we are, uh, as, you, as you, we probably had our, one of our, our early cases was March 15th and we've been uh, discharging people. We have a program in place to track individuals uh, up to about six months uh, post uh, discharge from COVID. And uh, we don't know very much right now what happens to people, whether they get uh, after improvement and discharge, do they stay stable? Do they get, uh, do they have any, uh, any uh, worsening of symptoms? So far, the, uh, based on those who have been discharged, the feedback has been that most people who have been discharged have actually done well once they got home, but we actually don't have that data. And that's part of what we're trying to track uh, for the future. My next question, uh, to save time in lab test costs, in practice, have you considered group specimen tests from several asymptomatic or potential patients? That, that is, uh, in a, in based on what we know about COVID and where we are right now, I don't know if anybody will be willing to do a group test because we know that asymptomatic individuals uh, may actually have uh, the virus. They just are not presenting with symptoms. So to group people together just based on symptoms, uh, being asymptomatic may not be ideal. Now, if you could do group testing where people come in at intervals to get tested, that makes sense. And that is consistent with some of the 
drive-by testing and some of the other uh, testing approaches. But having people come together, congregate, uh, and test them at the same time, I, I don't think it's ideal right now. Okay, we just have a few minutes remaining, but we uh, I think we'll still have time to get the rest of our questions in. Uh, next one, I got a mask from a friend that has a filter. Are there any safety concerns regarding filter use in the masks? Does the filter actually do anything? Well, the purpose of the cloth masks really is to prevent the large droplet spread from you yourself, whether or not you have symptoms to other people. The purpose is not to prevent infection of others coming to you. Um, so the addition of a filter, I can see filtering out smaller particles that maybe a cloth mask wouldn't be able to filter out as efficiently. But in terms of protection, I'm not entirely certain how much better protection you're going to get. I think Dr. Getty, you, you may have wanted to chime in. Yeah, so I, I think um, uh, for that a question, it depends on what they mean by uh, you know by filter. Are they talking about an N95 mask with a filter? Or are they talking about a regular home face mask with a filter? Uh, so as Dr. Sanchez has already uh, alluded to, a regular uh, home face mask with a filter is probably better than nothing, uh, better than regular face masks, but it's not, we don't know how much better it is. And uh, also, there's also the risk about, depending on what the filter is made of, there's also the risk of inhaling uh, uh, components in the filter. So I think we just need to be very uh, careful about what we use for the filter. And without having some level of, of understanding of what that filter contains, I think it's, uh, it's really important for people to pay attention to what they put in and what they use as filters. And, and while talking about masks in general, I think it's always good to highlight the importance uh, Dr. Sanchez, as you mentioned, the mask is really, pro, like the cloth mask, not the N95s, is really meant to protect other people if you have uh, the virus as well. Um, and it's really good to think about um, from that standpoint. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, so we know that, <laughs> my apologies, so we know that people who wear these cloth masks, um, in general, you tend to touch your face more often. So I think it's good to remember that when you're wearing a mask that we still want to limit how much you're fixing it or how much you're still touching your face, because we do know that if you wear a mask, you are more likely to touch your face. So I think it's really, really nice to think about the counseling point if you're going to wear a mask, that you really want to make sure that you're still aware of the actions of your hands and touching your face and, and the other safety precautions that we know sometimes people tend to neglect if they have that sense of security with the mask. So really using the mask as one additional tool in your toolbox to mitigate or to prevent the risk of contracting the illness uh, and really making sure that you're you're fully aware of everything else that can contribute as well. What is being done to increase transparency regarding reporting numbers of positive COVID cases and deaths in long-term care facilities? I believe that the state DHS website has uh, some tracking of outbreak investigations, though not, not certainly not certain to the level of detail. Uh, of our local monitoring and tracking dashboards, both at the Milwaukee County level and at the city of Milwaukee level, uh, those types of investigations would just be incorporated into overall testing rates. Our approach uh, as a city health department is certainly to encourage facilities to have transparency, uh, both with the public and with the, the residents and families of those individuals. Uh, we, however, will not um, release information that uh, the, the long-term care facilities don't want to have released. Okay, thank you. And then finally, uh, there's several questions um, regarding the number of deaths in, and hospitalizations in the state of Wisconsin being low when compared to the overall population of the state. Um, and so the question it becomes, why are we so worried about COVID versus other things like the flu and the cold? What makes this one so different?
Well, there's a lot that makes COVID uh, more concerning when we talk about uh, general populations and A, it's uh, transmissibility. Um, so the number of people that it get infected per infected individual, if you're not practicing some of these safety measures. Uh, to the degree of morbidity that it causes, particularly in the medically vulnerable and the elderly. Um, the, and the third being the um, issue of transmission um, in the asymptomatic state. And those are all um, of greater concern with coronavirus than, or at least uh, COVID-19 than with flu. And at this point, and what makes it Sorry, Dr. Lamberton. Go ahead. I would Go ahead. say we have no vaccine and we have a very large percentage of our population that remains susceptible. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's our last question and we're at time. So I will turn it back over to Mr. Nettles to close us out. Well, first and foremost, thanks to all the members of our community who joined us tonight and those of you who've come back on multiple occasions. We appreciate your checking in so that you can get good, accurate information about what's currently happening with COVID within our state and our community so that you can keep yourself and your family safe. Again, we encourage you to share this information. There's uh, information on the screen now about how you can get access to the infographics and other materials that we've discussed. Uh, during this town hall, we invite you to visit our covid19.ncw.edu site for this and lots of other available information. And please share the word with others in our community so that we beat this thing together. Finally, I want to thank another uh, all-star group of panelists tonight, Dr. Sanchez, Dr. Getty, uh, Dr. Parody, and Dr. Lambert. We appreciate your time this evening and more importantly for the outstanding work you're doing on behalf of our community. So thank you all and have a great evening.